the fragility of life, global politics, and the universal themes of conflict, power, and death. X is not one to conform. She abhors violence, which is why she says she thinks she's obsessed with it. Over her 40-year career, she's followed a range of artistic paths in painting, photomedia, performance, insulation and watercolour, and she worked for a decade as a tattooist. In 2000, X made contact with the CSIRO's Entomology Division, the Australian National Insect Collection, or ANIC as it's called. The life sciences, like the people I've worked with in the CSIRO, their objective and aim is to understand life and to protect it. I could never understand why scientists would develop nuclear weapons. I, I think that was probably the very first time I considered science in the service of death. And so I wanted to look at this parallel development. Parallel ecologies, I think you've, you've said. Yes. Yeah. And so evolution becomes more lethal in terms of weapon development, parallel to the very, very slow evolution of life on Earth. I felt that what was even more critical was to look at how science and scientists operate for or against us. Much of her practice is an extended allegory about the destructive impulses of the human race. The recurring motifs of the gun and the moth represent parallel ecologies. Moths symbolise nature. They have evolved over millennia to survive. Guns symbolise humans. Over a brief period, we have evolved technologies that are sowing the seeds of our destruction. In a way, watercolour is a kind of anachronistic medium in the sense that it's out of time, which also makes it timeless. Can we talk for a moment about the art forms that you've been drawn to, the medieval period and the Baroque? And of course, you know, the colonial period, watercolour has a reference to that. I studied painting and oil painting is the only paint one does, but it had a terrible health effect on me. So I had to look at an alternative. But it's also, I have a contrarian in me. And so everything that is deemed bad, I think is interesting. Um, tattooing was, you know, low. Watercolour, bad, feminine. <laughs> Um, you know, not real, that's what women do. Yeah. I mean, that's always been part of it. And the older I've gotten, the more interest I've taken in having precise ideas. And so in a way, tattooing taught me precision. You know, it, it forced me into precision. And along with that came precision of ideas. In 2008, the Australian War Memorial appointed you as an official war artist to observe peacekeeping activities of defence personnel who were stationed in the Solomon Islands. What led you to accept the commission and how did the experience influence your practice? Look, I think we, this country was officially at war for 20 years and nobody cared. We just kept on going with our life while all these people everywhere else's lives were being destroyed. I found it almost irreconcilable that we could just have this beautiful life, be unaffected and be at war. It didn't equate to any other previous situation this country had been in where hardship was experienced here, where people had an idea of the gravity. I was in a discussion with one of the soldiers who owned that Tampa helmet, and he'd said um, that in the army they call, in contemporary war, they call helmets brain buckets. 
and that's generally because of percussion, the, you Injuries. know, from in extremely loud sounds can yeah. cause their brain to, their skull to fracture inside the helmet. And there's also, though, an appreciation on your part um, of the sacrifices that people have made. I mean, these helmets were worn by individuals and they, they went into war on our behalf and just that experience and how challenging that must be. Absolutely, because those people end up suffering for the rest of their lives. Young men are soldiers, not old men. Yeah. And so these are unformed people who's generally speaking, I've known, met a lot of soldiers over the years, is that this is an extreme thing that happens to them. Yep. And something that will either live badly or well with them for the rest of their lives. Mm. So I'm not, you know, this is not about trashing, trashing people. No, no, no. At all. I mean, in a sense, cure for pain is a kind of ironic title in a sense, because there isn't necessarily a cure for the kind of pain that war no, wreaks on and, people. No, and a lot of these people, so for instance, the blue helmet is Peacekeeper's helmet. Um, uh, that was loaned to me by a uh, former, a member of the Rwanda group that went in. and were, He was a deeply traumatised person. Every one of those soldiers resigned yep. after that. So, you know, that's, it's not to say I don't have any empathy for something I completely disagree with. Mm. Because this is a system. This is an, a system that's been running for a million years. Mm. So in a sense, this work is really a denouncement of our predisposition to violence and the futility of armed conflict in a way, something that David Livingston Smith talks about in his book, The Most Dangerous Animal, i.e. us. Is it your hope that people will reflect or through this work, they will encourage them to reflect on the futility of war? What I'm more interested in is our complicity with foreign countries mm -hmm. is more the question I find an, en an endless one. What I hope for an audience to get from anything is just even a vague understanding. And I like to have the door open for, for easy entry. But as a takeaway, uh, I, you know, this is sort of our involvement over, in, century, over, over, over now over. a couple of centuries. Yeah. Um, in something so unbelievably futile. Mm. Um, but it's a gigantic industry. I mean, look, you know, how many times I've been asked, oh, oh, can art change things? Well, I don't think it can. All you can do is not be silent, I guess. in the most recent watercolour system, this is where the martyrs grow, that features the Bushmaster gun, which American servicemen used to fire on innocent, unarmed civilians in Baghdad during the invasion of Iraq, thinking, in fact, that they were insurgents. So I've spent time, quite a bit of time in Iran. Um, everywhere in Iran and the Middle East, a, 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 dead, a, a dead soldier is represented as a red tulip. And so out of that weapon grows numerous red tulips. As much as the poppy as a, as a symbol of war and death, as is the tulip in the Middle East. It's also indigenous to Turkey and Iran. People have a sense that they're a Dutch flower when they're in fact a Turkic and mm -hmm. Persian flower. They have always been used as a symbol of dead soldiers. The triptych system, this is the place where the martyrs grow, is being made into fabric, and then that fabric is being made into a dress, which is based on one of the dresses that Marilyn Monroe wore in her last unfinished film, Something's Gotta Give. So the work, in a sense, is about things like coercive control, toxic masculinity, and in some ways, by inference, domestic violence. 
I think the basis of the shotgun wedding dress and also the system dress, they're both costumes for Hollywood. For instance, with the system dress as Marilyn's last screen dress, was at that time she was being exploited left and right by everybody as a beautiful woman in cinema um, with incredibly predatory men and then predatory psychiatrists. So I think that she was, you know, a, a hugely exploited person. If I use a weapon to discuss scientific violence and lack of ethics, then I can also use a weapon to discuss the situation that women face. And a big part of the debate of domestic violence is the secrecy. It occurs behind closed doors. People are not aware until things get incredibly bad. Is it your hope when people look at the work, this work and others that you've made, that that will cause them in some ways to sit up and take notice and also, you know, maybe take action? Look, you can expect nothing. The systems are much more powerful than artworks. And I think it, it's hubris to consider that you, you can change something with a picture you made. But I think that if I say nothing, then that means I'm complicit with it. And so this has been an ongoing perception of what drives my work.